Welcome everybody to this research seminar. We have one more person coming in here. But I'm very happy, it's been a while ago since we had this water damage. On the plus side, everything looks very nice and fresh. I hope that the technique will work because it's just reinstalled. I'm very happy to have Ottmar Edenhofer here. Uh, he's the co-director with uh, Johan Rockström of, and, chief, and also the chief economist of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research as well as the director of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change, and professor for climate, climate economics and public policy at the Technische Universität Berlin. Uh, and some time back he wrote a PhD or a doctorate on the topic of social conflict and technological change. He also has, which is very fitting for being here, uh, actually a bachelor in uh, philosophy, a background in philosophy and uh, uh, also collaborates with lots of people that we have close connection to, like Mark Flaubert and uh, John Broom, you have written papers with them. So Otmar is a leading expert in the field of economics of climate change. His main research interests cover the impact of technological change on the cost and strategies of climate change mitigation, public finance, and distributional effects of climate policy instruments. And he also is very active as a, a scientific policy advisor. And, uh, Today he will talk about, which is a very interesting title, Climate, War and Science, Practical Dilemmas, Theoretical Challenges and a New Era of Climate Policy. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and indeed what I intend to do is to talk about climate, war and, and, and science. And I refer to the uh, war in the Ukraine, at least uh, uh, to refer to the impact of this war on, on, on climate policy. So, and what I would like to do is um, to explain a little bit my perspective, which goes beyond uh, the narrow subject of climate science and uh, even climate policy. And what I would like to do in my first step is I would like to, uh, to highlight where, where do we stand? So what is the starting point? What's the best way to think about the uh, status quo of climate policy? So then what should we do? It's a, a, a normative question globally and within the European Union. I do not refer to Sweden and I do not refer to Germany in particular. So this might be something which we could do in the, in the discussion. And then in my last step, I will argue that we are entering now a completely new phase of climate policy, which, which resembles a little bit what we have done in the past but I will argue why we entering in, in this new area and why this is nothing, which is something for the second phase of the 21st century and why we should take into account these aspects now. And here I refer to one important aspect, the carbon dioxide removals. You might say this is a, a completely uh, a very nerdy uh, subject and it's uh, just important for a few uh, climate policy analysts and experts, this is not true. Uh, what I will show you is that we are now living already in the shadow of an end game. And this end game uh, will be start in 2039 in the European Union, but we should take care of this end game now. So this is what I intend to do. And I hope that I can do this in the next 45 minutes. And of course, I, I will not go into all the science details, I would like to highlight uh, important aspects and I also intend to refer some of the philosophical aspects of the climate problem because I heard that this is an audience which might appreciate this. So this is not every, everywhere appreciated if you start to talk about as a philosopher. Uh, when I was co-chair of IPCC, uh, Working Group 3, I decided I should have a chapter on, on the ethics of climate change and I invited professional philosophers. And, and, and uh, all my colleagues resisted and said it's not a good idea because if you start to invite philosophers, so then basically you water down the clear messages because uh, uh, that's... Uh, nevertheless, I succeeded uh, and we had a chapter on, on ethics. So um, this hasn't been done again, but 
I invite you to read this chapter. John Broom was uh, uh, on on the writing team, and it's a, it's a, a fantastic. I feel it's a fantastic chapter. Many of us have read it. It's a great chapter. It's, it's very important for yeah. us to be able to yeah. explain what we're doing that has some kind of significance. Good, good. I I, I like to hear this, and uh, but but it was a very hard fight, and in, but in particular, natural scientists told me that that this is very risky to invite philosophers. Okay, good. Now, where do we stand? So. This is something which you know. It's one of these uh, incomprehensible figures of the IPCC. And uh, we like to produce such figures. And uh, uh, so I always tell my students, uh, you can get a, a Nobel Peace Prize even if you produce incomprehensible figures. So it's not always necessary to, to be understandable. But what this clearly shows is that uh, we see basically a dramatic increase of global mean temperature. It is unprecedented uh, in human history. It's unprecedented in uh, in, in Earth history. Uh, the 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 scale and and the speed of the increase is is really remarkable. And it is quite clear after 25 years of uh, research and and summary of the research that the increase of global mean temperature is caused by burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, and deforestation. There is no doubt about this. The crucial question from my point of view is, why should we be concerned uh, because of increasing global mean temperature? And here, this is the first step, which is interesting for philosophers. So after you have understood this graph, so then you basically leave the territory of pure natural science. Because when you ask the question, why should we be concerned, you have to refer to terms like damages, you have to embed this in a decision-making framework and this is nothing which is part of the vocabulary of physics. So damages and uh, even tipping points, this is a much broader subject which includes social science, decision theory and this kind of thing. So, so why should we be concerned? The, the first thing is that we should be concerned because uh, the increase of global mean temperature increases extreme weather events the frequency of extreme weather events and also the intensity of uh, 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 extreme weather events. And it was quite interesting in the last IPCC report in the IS6, so this was the first time that the IPCC was able to attribute the extreme weather events to the increase of global mean temperature. And, and what we are doing is basically we are shifting the temperature distribution and therefore we uh, get much more extreme heat events around the globe. So the extreme heat events then translates into, into climate damages, uh, and these extreme events are from an economic point of view, from a short-term perspective, extremely important. And I will refer to that in a minute a little bit more. But before I do this, here I refer to a paper which has been authored by Johan Rockström. This is the tipping point issue. This is the second important aspect. The first one is the extreme event, intensity uh, and frequency of extreme weather events. The second one are the tipping points. And the tipping points are activated in an irreversible way when global mean temperature passes a specific threshold. And here you see some of the tipping points. I don't want to go in all the tipping points, like, so to say, the, uh, the meltdown of the boreal permafrost or uh, the likelihood or the, po the possibility that the Amazonian forest will be transformed from a net sink to a net source. What I would like to highlight is that already a few tipping points will be activated between 1.5 and 2 degree. And the 1.5 and the 2 degree, these are the focal points, the normative focal points of the Paris Agreement. And this is by no means uh, a riskless, uh, 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 a riskless focal point. Because above 1.5, there is a likelihood that of the meltdown of the Greenland ice sheet, and there is also a high likelihood that the coral reefs will disappear around the globe. So, nevertheless, I want to focus a little bit now on the extreme weather events, because from an economic point of view, if you take into account the damages, uh, these are quite important. So what we did here is, uh, and this is what, what, what economists uh, contribute to the debate, we tried to calculate the economic losses uh, caused by rising the temperature in 2100 roughly plus 4 degree. And I would argue here that, that we are still on, on a 4 degree pathway. And I will say, uh, and we will refer to that 
in, in, in a minute. But let's assume that this is the business as usual scenario. So then it is quite clear that we have significant regional income losses. Why are the income losses? So if the extreme heat events increases, so you see basically in particular in Africa, a dramatic decline in labor and in capital productivity. Labor productivity, because if it is very hot, so uh, people lose labor productivity. Capital productivity, because it's very hard, if it is very hot, for example, to, to, to come up with manufacturing industry or also reconstruction industry. So the, uh, the, the global average uh, could be about 50% of the income losses, the global GDP, admittedly. Here we are only taking into account uh, losses caused in the market economy. So, and we do not take into account the, the losses of, uh, um, uh, let's say, of the, of, of the Greenland ice sheet. We do not take into account intrinsic values. We know that people value have an intrinsic value for nature, for a stable climate. These are just the goods which are traded on the market. But even if you do this as a very conservative estimate, you come with a, a number of 40% uh, uh, of the, the, the income loss and you can translate this into a matrix which is very uh, well uh, elaborated in economics. We call this the social costs of carbon. The social costs of carbon measures the damages which is caused by one ton CO2. And this is then between 150 to $800 per ton. Why is this important? It is uh, very important because the social costs of carbon um, uh, serve as a tool in particular in the United States to measure the, the, the regulatory effort. So if a government uh, basically uh, puts a regulatory framework in place, which only costs, let's say, $20 per ton. So then uh, economists would argue that this is not ambitious enough because if you want to have a regulation which is consistent with the damages you are causing, then you should basically do uh, 140 euros now and 800 euros uh, in, uh, by the end of the century. So this is just an order of magnitude showing so what causes basically one additional ton on the damages. And then you can ask the question, what is the cost to reduce one ton of emissions, which is uh, below, currently below the social costs of carbon, just as an, uh, for, the, for the sake of comparison, we have now roughly 100 euros uh, in, the, in the emission trading scheme in the European Union. But this is, this is a lower bound. It's a very conservative estimate, but this conservative estimate shows you that the climate damages are much larger for most countries than, than, than the financial crisis. And again, it's a, it's a quite conservative uh, measure. So if we take into account the tipping points, if we take into account the extreme weather events, and even if we would do a very narrow-minded and a very rough uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis, some of these uh, 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 papers show that we could justify based on a cost-benefit analysis already the 1.5, the 2 degree range of the, of the Paris Agreement. I think that's, that's quite important to understand. You don't need uh, a very, um, uh, very extreme assumptions to come up with, with, with such, an, uh, such a number. So far, so good. So we know that we are causing the problem. We can, we can, can, can translate uh, this problem into damages. We have a, a decision theoretic framework, which might be very narrow minded and even, even flawed uh, to a certain extent because it does not take into account intrinsic values and all sorts of things. But we, based on this, we can justify the, the, the Paris goals, the Paris limit as a, as a focal point. Now, what I would like to do is now to show you why climate policy is such a thorny and such a complicated issue. Because one aspect is important. Whatever you do, whatever you advocate for, a 1.5, a 2 degree, even a, a, a 2.5 degree target, it is very important to understand, according to the IPCC, um, you can translate this temperature goal into a global carbon budget. And I would say this is probably the most important insight and the most important conclusion of the IPCC Working Group 1 and Working Group 3 that we can, can translate it in a global carbon budget. 
And I would say, from an economics point of view, um, from a philosophical point of view, this is extremely important. And this I would like to highlight here with this graph. A two degree limit we would allow to release roughly additional 1,000 gigaton CO2 into the atmosphere. For a 1.5 it's 285, so I basically decided to do something around uh, 1.6 and 1.7 and then basically we have 660 gigaton CO2. This is important because what it says that the atmosphere is a limiting disposal space. And for this limiting disposal space, we have to define user rights. Or the other way around, you could say, humankind is forced to come up with an international agreement which defines the atmosphere as a global common. And for this global common, we need user rights. And we have to do this in a fair and in an efficient way. And it's quite interesting. So when I, when I basically was co-chair in the IPCC, uh, the overwhelming majority of scientists want to have this sentence, the atmosphere is a global commons, full stop. This has been deleted by the governments. Why? It has been deleted because if there's something like a global common, this basically, in particular United States, is forced to intervene. So the, 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 the oceans are global commons. And if there's a threat to the global commons, they are legally obliged to, to intervene. And most governments want to avoid a legal, a legal obligation for intervention. And then we had a footnote. And the footnote says, there are some social science concepts which perceive the atmosphere as a global commons. But at least in this footnote, uh, it has been highlighted the first time the atmosphere is a global commons. By the way, and I dare to do this in, in, in Sweden, uh, because I, at this time I was uh, an advisor of Pope Francis and I disagree with him on many things, but in his encyclical Laudato to see had a full-fledged full sentence. The atmosphere is a global commons for humankind. Not in a footnote, but just in a blunt, in a, in a blunt sentence. And it is number uh, 23. And I think this is very important because, because this is a, a very important uh, aspect in philosophy. It goes back to Thomas Aquinas because they perceived, so to say, natural resources as, as a global common for humankind and private property rights are only, only justified or can only be justified if they allow to use the global commons in an appropriate way. So this is a, a, a very important aspect that social obligations uh, are uh, superior to, to the exercise of private property rights. So this is, this is you can say, this is this, this, this definition. So we, are, we, we, can, we can fight about the concrete numbers, which we are, by the way, doing all the time. But this clearly shows the atmosphere is a limiting disposal space. So the drama unfolds when you uh, look at, at the other reservoir we have on, on planet Earth, these are the reservoir of fossil fuels. We have 15,000 gigatons CO2 in form of coal, oil and gas underground. If you look at this picture here, it is quite clear whatever we do with this limiting disposal space of the atmosphere, if you limit this, let's say, around the, the, the Paris goals, this implies that the majority of resources and reserves have to remain underground, 80 to 90 percent. And you can translate this in another way, I could say, any kind of climate policy leads to a devaluation of the assets of the owners of coal, oil and gas. This is just a logical implication of any kind of climate policy. It's almost a miracle that in Paris, even the owners of coal, oil and gas agreed to, to the Paris Agreement and accepted in principle that 80 to 90 percent of the fossil fuels have to remain underground. And uh, in one of the interviews in 2010, I said climate policy is nothing else than the redistribution of the global wealth, which I referred to exactly to, to, this, to this figure here. And then many climate uh, deniers in, in the US said that this clearly shows that behind the climate uh, agenda, the policy agenda, there is very clear 
a hidden Marxist uh, conspiracy. So this has nothing to do with Marxism. It's, from my point of view, uh, an implication of pure logic, right? If you say, basically, we have to limit the use of the atmosphere, we have to transform um, the atmosphere from, from, a, uh, from a wild uh, de depony into a global commons, which well-defined user rights according to the principles of fairness and, and justice, so then basically this is a logical implication that we have to devalue other assets. But this is, from my point of view, the drama of the whole climate policy. So we, we can elaborate endlessly about the tipping points, about damages, but this is, this is basically the drama of, of climate policy. And we have to deal with this. So think for a while the other way around. Think for a while, we would be in a completely different situation. We would have 660 gigatons CO2 in form of oil and gas underground, and we would have 50,000 gigatons. Uh, uh, we could uh, release 50,000 gigatons into the atmosphere. Think for a while, we would be in such a situation. So, what, what, how would our thinking look like? So, this would imply that we are really. Uh, have a, a, a strong scarcity on coal, oil and gas. And we would anticipate a strong increase of the oil and gas prices around the globe. And definitely I wouldn't be here as a climate economist, I would be probably here as a resource economist and tell you that we have to increase energy efficiency, we should deploy renewables if we would survive the global market forces. And you would, I would have all the economic ministers, all the finance ministers around the globe on my side. They would give endless speeches in, international, uh, uh, in, in, in the international platforms telling people that basically due to this increasing resource and gas prices, energy efficiency is an absolutely must uh, in, in, in all the countries. Nobody would talk about climate. And this is the problem here. Uh, so given the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere, we have now an oversupply of fossil fuels. We are not running out of fossil fuels. And the international resource markets will not, the, will not do the job for us. So if we would live in another situation where we have 660 gigatons underground, the resource markets will do the trick for us. They will increase the resource prices due to the scarcity. Everybody would be, com it would be a completely an issue of, of competitiveness of a country to implement energy efficiency policies. Now we are in a completely different situation because now competitiveness is not on our side. Because whenever we say we have to, we have to increase the resource prices for oil and gas, the economic ministers will say this might hamper our competitiveness. Because if we, if we reduce emissions, other countries uh, might behave as free riders and then we will lose. So in that sense, the international resource markets in this, uh, in this other world view, where we basically would have an undersupply of fossil fuels, would be fabulous because in the end there would be no necessity for an international agreement, so the resource markets will do the trick for us. But now we need an international agreement, we need something where basically everybody can agree, we, if we can penalize the free riders, because otherwise some countries might lose uh, the competitiveness. So this is, this is the problem, and this is a completely different thing. And I would say this is the first time in human history, in human history, that we are not forced to react to the scarcity caused by nature. It's the first time that we, via an international agreement, have to create a scarcity, right? So that's, that's the first time, and, and this, is, this is the challenging and the very demanding situation for, for, for global climate policy. And this has a lot to do with, with uh, the self-enforcement of agreements, this has a lot to do with ethics, this has a lot to do with cooperation, because if, if, if just the resource market would do the trick, there would be no need for a cooperation. A little bit, but not too much. But now here we, are, we, 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 we need this, and, and this, is, this is, from my point of view, the real challenge. Now where we are today, um, emissions are still rising after the corona crisis, so we are back on our initial pathway, and this has a lot to do, I will tell you that in a, in a minute, what happened during the, the war in the, in, in the Ukraine. So emissions are rising and rising, and uh, so we are living still internationally in an area of fossil fuels, 
the last decade was dominated by a huge expansion of coal-fired plants. And if you look at this graph, you don't see too much of the uh, of, of international effort. I, I'm not denying that there are some success stories, and I will refer to that because otherwise uh, you might be too depressed. But, but at the global scale, we are not in a situation where we bend the curve. So one thing is interesting. So uh, this is the first time we are carrying out all the time regular surveys. And uh, we saw over the last decade uh, this renaissance of coal. But now uh, the service this indicates that, that uh, some countries start now really to cancel investments in, in coal-fired plants. Now, of course, you might say, OK, what, what happened? There are some success stories. Uh, first of all, the costs of climate-friendly technologies are decreasing. This is the case for PV, for wind, and so on. We have a, a lot of market penetration uh, for uh, electricity. Uh, and 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 batteries and so on. So this this is a success story. The costs for solar and wind power, as well as for batteries, have declined up to 85 percent. Then there's a strong installed capacity. Policy measures and law have enhanced energy efficiency, reduced deforestation, and accelerated the deployment of renewables. And there's a growing share of countries which have sustainably reduced greenhouse gas emissions for more than 10 years. In particular, this can be highlighted for the European Union as a whole. But still, there's a problem here. And I would call this the problem the power of the relative prices. And I would like to share with you this slide here. What you see here is basically the price trajectory for oil, for coal and for gas. And I ignore for a while the, the, the price fluctuations uh, in the electricity market. So what you can see basically is due to the Ukrainian war, the natural gas uh, increase was much stronger than, than coal. So this is now changing a bit. But this led to a situation uh, where in particular in the Asian countries, they have used uh, coal-fired plants more extensively in order to save gas and to sell the gas uh, at the international uh, LNG markets, the liquid natural uh, gas markets. And also, uh, this basically uh, emphasized and enforced the continuation, I already mentioned this, the continuation of the renaissance of coal. And, and how severe this renaissance of coal really is, I would like to share with you uh, with this slide here. Here you see, for example, the usual suspects, China and India. And what this graph shows is how much in, uh, emissions are released into the atmosphere cumulatively over the economic lifetime uh, of the uh, coal-fired plants. And it turns out, over the economic lifetime worldwide, all the coal-fired plants will produce roughly 300 gigatons CO2. Remember my, my number, 660? So basically, coal-fired plants alone will absorb half of the available carbon budget. And if we cannot stop this renaissance of coal, so then, basically, we are not in a position to keep the door open for any kind of ambitious climate policy. And uh, you should not think that it is just China and India. It is also Indonesia, it's the United States, it's Vietnam, it's Turkey, and it, by the way, it's also Germany. After the Fukushima event in Germany, we built 10 new coal-fired plants. So we are a coal-dependent country, uh, even comparable to, to Poland, and we are not well advised to finger point to our neighbors here. So what I'm saying here is that the coal-fired plants alone is a, a small part of the global infrastructure. The transport system, the heating system, uh, the building sector, all of this adds up. And, and but, but I think it is important that we decarbonize the power uh, sector completely. And from my point of view, it is absolutely essential uh, that in the international negotiations we start with the right priorities and one of the most important priorities would be uh, from my point of view to um, uh, to start and to kick off uh, this global coal phase out now let me say a few things so what should we do i mentioned already the coal phase out but let me say a little bit more on on the, on the global scale so this is one of the, the most important figures um, uh, my colleagues like to, to, to present, 
here you see the blue line and the blue line is consistent with the 1.5 or the two degree target and uh, the orange line this is uh, the the ndc's so this is what countries have promised in the international negotiations you see basically uh, what they promised is not sufficient at all uh, to 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 um, to bend the curve and to reduce the emissions and it's even worse what the countries have promised uh, they they didn't keep to their promises but this is the normative pathway so to say we have to bend the curve very soon then we have to reduce emissions roughly between six to eight percent annually we have to achieve carbon neutrality the zero line by 2050 and at the end of the century we need negative emissions why do we need negative emissions we need negative emissions because most of the scenarios show that we cannot keep strictly uh, the line below the 1.5 so we will overshoot let's say to 1.6 to 1.7 to 1.8 which is by no means a riskless exercise but in order to to bend the temperature curve and to 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 bring the curve back to the 1.5 limit so we need the negative emissions I, I will go back to that in in, uh, in 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 my presentation here but the negative emissions are an, a, a prerequisite to to compensate um, the, the the overshoot and I would say here over the last let's say two decades we had one fundamental principle in the international negotiations which is an ethical principle not an economic principle and this principle has been called polluter pay if somebody emits at least he should or she should pay most countries do not pay some countries pay but at least as a normative principle it's important the polluter pay principle and it has nothing to do with economic efficiency because we could also say uh, we pay the polluter from a from an efficiency point of view according to coast so the polluter pay principle is important but then we have to introduce a second principle and i would like to call this principle uh, clean up your mess the negative emission technology is something which should help us to clean up the mess because to reduce emissions from the atmosphere so we used we have overused the limiting disposal space and therefore we should absorb this and these two principles that is are important and the second principle clean up your mess will become very very important uh, uh, in in the next decade so so you see basically the peak should be uh, achieved already yesterday then steep uh, uh, cuts in the emissions carbon neutrality and then the net removals how to do this we need to decarbonize the power sector fully because electrification is an important aspect so then uh, based on on the decarbonized power sector we should decarbonize uh, the transport sector aviation shipping the heavy industry and then we we have to compensate some of the hard to avoid residual emissions but this is not good enough just to compensate at some stage we need net negative emissions so this is this is where we are and this is what we should do okay so I, I will skip this and and come to my to my next slide um, this is a slide about democracies and about autocracies and you might say what what is this guy now completely crazy he talks about coal and he talks about emissions and he talks about limiting disposal space and now he talks about uh, uh, democratization and and autocracies um, I, I will explain you why I intend to do this. First of all, I would like to highlight here uh, that basically we have a, a very remarkable development uh, that uh, we see a, a sharp increase after the uh, the, the, the fall of the of the, the fall of, the, of in, in Berlin. We saw a strong increase of, of democracies and, and a decline of autocracies. So this is quite remarkable. And some people might say, okay. Uh, these are good news yes this might be good news but if you look at the autocracies a specific type of autocratic regimes have been increased and I call this the personalist I political scientists uh, call this the personalist autocracies and I explain you in a minute why I refer to that because personalistic autocracies need a relatively low winning coalition to survive and this is now important for my second argument because in the end what I would like to do is I would like to explain you that climate policy in the future has a lot to do with the relationship between democracies 
and autocracies. And democracies are under a severe pressure. And we have seen in the last 16 years also a demographic decline. But why, as a climate economist, I'm interested in this relationship between democracies and autocracies? So what I have done here is, this is a, a snapshot in time for 2019, uh, the gas, oil, and total natural resource rents. So we economists are obsessed by thinking about rents. So rents, for, uh, for, for the sake of the argument here, are just the revenues uh, from, from selling uh, oil, gas, and oil at the international market. But when I refer to the rents, so gas and oil is not valuable because it costs money to extract resources from underground. So we see basically most of the, the value for the countries is just a scarcity value. Even there, there would be no extraction costs. So we will see uh, severe rents. And what you see here, if you look at the gas and the oil rents, so non-democratic countries rely very much on, on, on selling oil, for example. It's around yeah, uh, 7 to 75% on their GDP. And if you basically include in this calculation not just oil and gas, but also coal, forests, and mineral resources, you can see basically uh, the average resource rent by regime type is, is roughly 10% for non-democratic or autocratic regimes. And also it's below uh, 3% for democracies. So most autocracies are very much dependent on, 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 on resource rents. And you know, you might know, there is a huge debate on, on this resource course, to what extent uh, selling resources on the market, depending on the resources, is a curse or a blessing. I don't, I don't want to discuss this. What I would like to do is, after this snapshot in time, I would like to show you a scenario, how a word on gas, oil and gas rents would look like if we would be successful implementing a 1.5 or a 2 degree limit. And this is just a scenario, but I think this is an important one. So here you see a, a busy map. And first of all, what you see is basically here um, the, the decline of, of the, the resource rents for uh, here, this is for oil, this is for coal, and this is for gas. And this is the, deg the, the two degree word. So this is calculated on a net present value. And you see basically at, at the globe as a whole, we see a remarkable decline of, of resource rents. And in particular, when we move from the two degree to the 1.5, because then the oil exporting countries will lose dramatically, really dramatically. So the nice thing is this will be overcompensated by the revenues from carbon pricing. Because in one way or another, so this kind of, of word implementing a 2 degree or 1.5 needs carbon pricing in one way or another. So if you don't believe that, or you don't believe me that this is the right thing to do, let's do this in the discussion, because I don't want to, to, to discuss too much ab about this issue. But the most important thing is, if you look at here the MENA region, so they will really lose resource rents. Russia will lose resource rents. Europe, almost nothing, because we have already decarbonized our economies. So we rely very much on, on exports of uh, high-value goods on, on, on the market. US, a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is something that in America, not too much. But the MENA region in Africa will lose a lot. And this is basically a, a kind of a word map where you can see, basically, that climate policy could and will cause some conflicts, some severe conflicts. Just to say one thing here, and uh, I, I would like to elaborate a little bit more because due to the time I, I cannot do this. It is important to understand that the countries like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar and other countries, they will lose in a climate policy with really a lot of resources. One way to do this is either uh, to invest in renewables, to invest in hydrogen, or to invest in carbon dioxide removal technologies, because this could rescue some of the resource rents. And I think they will do this. So Aramco, Saudi Arabia or Aramco announced that they will come up with direct air capture, which are technical filters to absorb CO2, 
and then basically provide this atmospheric CO2 for the production of, of uh, syn fuels, for uh, synthetic fuels. So this is something they, they, they might do. And they might do this in order to, to help other countries uh, to implement such kind of policies and to use a little bit longer the, 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 the fossil fuels. So this, this is a, a quite interesting situation. In addition to that, to this uh, uh, resource rent loss, and these are exactly the countries will suffer also a lot from the economic losses caused by climate change. And I think this is something which needs a much more thorough analysis. And here I would like to <coughs> highlight a little bit the issue. I have no solution for this, but I think it is important that we do much more research on, on this subject. So climate policy ambitions of rich countries are going to reduce autocracy's resource rents. So this is my first statement. The question is, how will autocracies react to this threat? Autocracies, and this is my argument here, mostly have smaller winning coalitions. Think about these personalized autocracies. And a relatively small group decides on the political survival of autocratic decision makers. Smaller winning coalitions make it relatively easy for autocracies to socialize the costs of ag aggression uh, while privatizing its gains. Those autocracies have citrus paribus, a greater incentive for aggression or even war because they must price in the costs of aggression to a lesser extent than democracies. And how will autocracies react to this threat? Due to the often large wealth gap between autocracies and democracies, the former would likely lose a war against the later. In a globalized world, war is only one form of aggression. Many more subtle forms of aggression exist, and the greater the interdependence between the two countries or between autocracies and democracies, the stronger is their potential impact. So unchecked climate change is a massive threat, also for autocracies, but this might create incentives to cooperate. But this means that autocracies are increasingly pursuing a strategy, what uh, Dresner called weaponized interdependence. And this could mean that trade relations, the ownership of fossil fuel and mineral resources, as well as agricultural commodities, and compensation claims for climate damages can be instrumentalized for the sake of geopolitical conflicts. Examples are Nord Stream 2, Russia hinders Ukrainian grain exports, Nigeria might demand compensation in exchange for gas. This strategy is effective because democratic policymakers have a strong incentive not to punish autocracies for pursuing weaponized interdep uh, interdependence. Why? Um, so weaponized interdependence is a very subtle form of aggression. Punishing autocracies can be politically costly. And the result is under certain uh, conditions, autocracies can use weaponized uh, interdependence to exploit democratic regimes. Although weaponized interdependence has gained relevance, we do not have a a sound and a reasonable understanding of the underlying strategic logic. I have no solution for this, but I would like to put this on the table that weaponized interdependence will become an important issue and we have to analyze the international climate regimes also in this context. So what can we do to, to facilitate international cooperation? I will skip this because I'm I'm running out of time and I would like to, to, to talk a little bit about the second phase of, of, of climate policy and, and therefore I, I think I, sh I should uh, speed up uh, a little bit so that we have time for, uh, for discussion. Now let me talk a little bit about the European Union because it's really remarkable what the European Union is doing and I will not explain the full uh, green European Green Deal. This would be a fascinating subject. What I would like to do is I would like to convince you why I believe that now we are entering in a new phase of, of climate policy and I would like to explain that a little bit. And I intend to argue uh, that this climate policy is in the shadow of an end game and let me explain the end game a little bit more. So this is what the European Union has highlighted, they want to reduce the emissions and they want to approach the zero line in 2040 and in 2039 in the European Emissions Trading Scheme the last permit will be sold. So the last, the last permit. 
but there will be residual emissions in the system. So think about now how an investor today will think about this problem. It could be the case that he anticipates that the European Commission will do nothing. If they will do nothing, so he might bank a lot of emission trading, a, a lot of permits. He might also say, I don't believe that they will compensate this. Uh, the market will break down anyway, and therefore I do not I, I, I will not invest in, in climate policy. So there's a risk of the breakdown of the market. Whatever we think about this, this is an end game in 2039, and this end game shadows already the investment decisions today. So therefore, the European uh, Commission is very well advised to announce at some stage in the next few years what the EU Commission intends to do with the residual emissions in particular caused by the hard to abate sectors, the cement industry, the transport industry and the building sector. And this is the reason why I believe the compensation of this residual emissions is important and why a specific component uh, of uh, the technology portfolio, which is called the CDR, plays such an important role. So I will skip this because this is not so important, but here we are. So we are basically have now, uh, we are struggling, with, still we are struggling with the first phase of climate policy, that's true. But here you see basically in particular the global scale I have shown you, we need the negative emissions. And the negative emissions are something which might allow us to clean up the mess in the atmosphere, but from a European perspective, uh, we are already living in this uh, shadow of, of the end game and, and how should we deal about this? Of course, there are many pathways. So there are scenarios which basically show that we can limit the CDR options. There are some scenarios where we basically have a, 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 a very large, um, a large share of, of CDR, uh, which, which all the risks. So this is not just something and this is what would we have. We have a choice to make. This is nothing which is which is imposed uh, on us by by nature, so we can make a choice. But most of the scenarios uh, clearly show that we need this CDR options here. And this basically is something which is quite important to understand. I told you in my in the beginning that climate policy is all about managing, so to say, uh, the commons of the atmosphere, pursuing and perceiving the atmosphere as a global common because we have an inflow from the energy system we have an inflow from the land use and deforestation but this is now not good enough because we have filled up the atmosphere so much that we need something which we basically can uh, absorb some of the co2 and then for that we need new carbon sinks we need new carbon reservoirs uh, in soil in forests uh, in geological formations. And this is, from my point of view, ethically a huge issue. It's not just that the atmosphere is a global commons. We have now to learn that geological formations, the soils, the forests, the biosphere, is to a certain extent uh, a, a global common because it provides carbon sinks. And we need these carbon sinks, otherwise we cannot deal with that. Unfortunately, some of these carbon sinks do not store carbon permanently but only in an impermanent and non-permanent way and then we might have a small inflow again. So this is something which we have to manage. The second phase of climate policy globally at the European level is nothing more and else than managing the global carbon cycle, an industrial management of the global carbon cycle. And this starts now because it is not good enough, it is not sufficient just to uh, take into account the atmosphere, we have to take into account all the other carbon sinks. And if we take into account the carbon sinks, we have a very natural linkage to the issues of food security, water and biodiversity. So that's, that's the challenge. Just to show you how complex such an issue is, so this is, and, and how the linkages are. So this is, this is the way how most people think about our electricity and energy system where we have to do a lot of direct electrification. So this is basically producing electricity and then we, we need electrification in the building and the transport in the industry sector. So then we have indirect electrification via green hydrogen, via electrolysis. 
then uh, we have basically we will use this uh, also then for primary steel chemicals aviation so this is this is how most decision makers discuss the current transformation of our economy but now the carbon cycle comes in here in a very complex way and i have shown you this uh, a minute before so we have to produce synthetic fuels for some of our hard to abate sectors aviation in particular the chemical industry um, and so on but to do this we need co2 and hydrogen what kind of co2 can we use we cannot use the co2 from burning coal oil and gas we can only do this using co2 either from biomass or atmospheric co2 which we which we then basically um, absorb from uh, fr from the atmosphere biomass the biomass supply is very limited on a global scale therefore you need atmospheric co2 also for e-fuels and some of this atmospheric co2 has been stored then in geological uh, formation so this is a, an enormously complex thing and if we want to basically in the end come up with a reasonable way for the management of the global carbon cycle so this should just show you how complex such a management will be and how complex such a governance structure in the end will be so that that's that's from my point of view the important thing and this is why i believe that now we entering in the in the second phase and the second phase cannot wait uh, a decade more so this is something which we have to do now so let me conclude so what kind of messages would i i would like to convey the climate crisis has not been uh, solved so we are not even close to a pathway that is compatible with the Paris Agreement. Democracies and autocracies struggle for the systemic domination. Oil, gas, grains, international trade relations are weaponized. The concept of peace via interdependence and change to trade is not wrong per se, I believe, but we have to take into account the strategic options democracies have much more seriously. Democracies need to adapt their approach to international relations to the challenge caused by this weaponized interdependence. The implementation of the Green Deal, I touched on this, is indispensable in this conflict. CDR as a way to clean up the mess in the atmosphere is necessary to reach the climate targets. Removals and or storage needs to be subsidized while simultaneously accounting for leakage. The global carbon cycle needs a permanent management. This is a huge challenge for humankind to think uh, carefully and also normatively in the right way about this permanent management. Differences in the permanence of storage sites are a challenge when designing adequate policy instruments for CDR. So this is the new phase of climate policy, the industrial management of global carbon cycle. And this CDR option might be used in a way which could in the end enhance international cooperation anyway i think this is a huge challenge and i hope i have convinced you that if you are uh, a political scientist a philosopher interested in ethics so there is a lot of things to do here and we need this kind of inputs because climate policy the industrial management of carbon cycle needs a much broader perspective i hope i have convinced you about this thanks Thank you very much, Otmar. There's going to be lots of questions on this great talk. We're going to say something about that while we, we, of course, have a mixed audience, audience here and audience online. So for the question and answer period, you that are online, you use the chat function. So if you wish to ask a question, you write it in the chat. And we also would like uh, your field, because we like to mix questions from different fields. So tell us about your area of studies. And it, we also allow for follow-up. So in the chat, you just write follow-up and to the person who just asked the questions. And they are talking before new questions. Very good. And with that, I open the floor. And I see Ulle. So you can start. And keep your hands up. Thank you very much. Me too. Yep. Thank you very much. Very interesting and very uh, inspiring. Uh, I have a question about one of the proposals you mentioned uh, initially. You said that um, we need to leave 80 to 90 percent of the fossil fuels in the ground. And you said that that follows more or less logically from the, the uh, uh, temperature targets that we have all agreed on. And therefore, 
um, it's a bit surprising that not everyone agrees about this recommendation uh, to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. But then you started to talk about the need to eventually reach negative emissions and the uh, availability of uh, negative emissions technologies in order to reach those negative emissions. And uh, given that there is there are those technologies and uh, doesn't that uh, the possibility of such technologies uh, imply that th there is after all an open question whether we need to leave these 80 to 90 percent of the fossil fuels in the ground and given that isn't it um, uh, I mean intelligible why there is a disagreement regarding that proposal and hence that's something that also needs to be discussed more properly yeah thanks should I respond immediately or should should we collect? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, thanks. This is a very important question, but but this is an uh, an issue in the order of magnitude. So what what we can do is so basically CDR is fundamentally not an option to avoid emission reduction. So when we talk about CDR, we are talking about as an order of magnitude, let's say between five to ten gigatons annually, and then we need the negative and net negative, which basically means we have to achieve the zero line. So the order of magnitude 5 to 10 gigatons per annum to achieve negative emissions, n not just to compensate fossil fuels, so does not rescue too much of the fossil fuel rents, a bit. But this is in the range between 80 to 90 percent. So it's it's the CDR is not primarily rescuing the, 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 the resource rents of the owners of fossil fuels. It's just basically to clean up the mess which we have already done in the atmosphere. So that's, that's but ju just to give you a, a number, five to 10 gigatons CO2 and with a price between 100 to 300 gigatons. So this is then something around the 3% of the world GDP. So basically what we are doing is we creating a new waste sector, right? And, and but, but this does not, uh, so if, if you believe it, it's such a large scale that we could say, uh, we, we can use only 60% or something like this, and then we use all the other reservoirs. That that's uh, the carbon sink. That's that's far too 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 complicated or far too risky. Mm. Thanks. I expected you to say something like that, and I think the reason why I asked it, I think it should be uh, brought up more explicitly. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have a follow-up from Joran Dus Otterström online. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Excellent. So, so that was an, uh, an enormously um, interesting uh, talk. I had a follow-up question. I, I basically wanted to ask Ulla's question, but I have a follow-up question regarding the political risks of starting to plan for phase two of climate policy, as you put it already. And of course, we know that we have to start doing that planning. And planning for phase two does not mean that we can uh, go easier in phase one. We know that, but there might be political risk here. And I was interested in uh, how you assess that risk, the, the, the sense that starting to plan for negative emissions technology on a big scale, not comparatively speaking massive, but a big scale is sort of going to reduce the sense of urgency to complete phase one of, of climate policy. Do you recognize that risk? Uh, that there is such a political risk, and if so, how would how would we manage it? Yeah, first of all, I I see this political risk, and one way to do this is to to come up with let's say, um, with with a CDR target, uh, an explicit CDR target, which basically then allows to to compensate some of the residual emissions, but also for negative. But it should be clear uh, that that emission reduction bending the curve emission reduction annually by six to eight seven percent is is unavoidable so this this uh, th th so this should be quite clear i would phrase it not so much as uh, cdr is a way how we can postpone uh, mitigation it's more how to clean up the mess i think that's a that's a different uh, a different framing it's more about a planetary waste management than just to say uh, you can do a little bit more. You can use coal longer and 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 this this kind of things. So um, I see this is political hard. But the other way around, we have to say something about CDR, because otherwise we are at risk that there's a breakdown of of the 
of the emission trading scheme. And we could say, okay, these are the residual emissions in 2039, which we will accept, and this will be compensated, but no more. But then we have a very clear, uh, a, a very clear, let's say, announcement, and this could stabilize the the expectations. Of course, there's a huge risk that all sorts of lobby groups will then basically try to influence the the Commission. But one thing I would like to highlight here is, and this is quite important, there is now a European scientific advisory board on on climate change and this is this is basically written in law that this scientific advisory council has to come up with a european climate budget and also with uh, has to say something about about the cdr and the commission has to respond to that so and and then there is this target is is then basically a, a focal point i wouldn't say it's it's fixed for 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 now and forever but it is a focal point and I think then it is very hard for lobby groups then to influence the Commission too, too, too strongly. This is at least my hope, because I am leading this uh, European Scientific Advisory Board and therefore I have some hope that we might be successful. Well, then actually I'm next on the list, taking the opportunity. What I really liked about your talk is that it moved into the territory of power. You, that I think is too little discussed when it comes to climate change. And I have two questions connecting to that. I mean, you mentioned the polluter pays principle, but I think everything you said uh, points to the other principle, pay polluters. We need to buy them out, because as you said, you talked about this uh, independence, you, we have the fossil industry, they have uh, all the incentives to try to go on with what they're doing. We have these autocracies, they also have the incentives to go on. So we need to change that by buying them out. But that was not something that came out at all, I think, in your talk. Yeah. Th that was the first question. Okay, and then the sec yeah. Yeah, second, connected to that. Uh, so you di did move into this kind of weaponized uh, interdependence, and you had a picture of uh, uh, democracy and autocracies kind of struggle for domination. I think that picture is a bit too simple, because a lot of democracies support autocracies. I mean, just take United States and Saudi Arabia. So there's a very clear that where some democracies actually have supported and even overturned democratic governments, and we have a whole history of that. So it's a rather more complex picture than democ the good democracies on one side and, and the nasty autocracies on the other side. Yeah, so th of course. So let me, let me start with, with your first question, uh, paying the polluter. That's, um, so first of all, polluter pay and paying the polluter, the one is... So for economists, the Pigubian perspective, the other one is the Cosian perspective, yeah. right? Both can be very efficient and uh, we could also say, okay, let's, let's, let's buy coal-fired plants around the globe and, and then we, we pay the polluter. Okay, let, but let me, let me um, so I have a, a, a very nuanced way to think about this. I think, and, and I had no time to, to elaborate this, but now I have the opportunity to do this. So first, I think it would be a smart way to say, let's use the multilateral development banks buying some of the coal-fired plants in particular in Southeast Asia. Why? Because most of them are state-owned enterprises, highly debted. And what we could do is we could say, by the way, we, 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 we buy them and then we have basically a still phase-out plan, then you have revenues and then you get rid of the debt and then you can also basically reform your electricity markets. So this is a little bit more compensating then via a very subtle way with the multilateral development banks. And I think that's that would be, from my point of view, a very good way in the next COP to think about the global coal phase out. So using the multilateral development banks and, and to do this. By the way, there's a really an important number which I learned three days ago and this is really mind boggling. If you would sum up all state-owned enterprises on planet Earth, they would produce as much as emissions almost like China. So if we would focus on state-owned enterprises, the emissions they cause, the, the we, we could achieve a lot. And this is one way to do this because, because uh, and this, this has some, uh, some, 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 some paying the polluter, but then reciprocity is important. So if we do this, so then basically they have to, they have to offer something like basically the reform of the electricity market or introducing a carbon price, something like this. On gas and oil, I think differently about this. And I think the Ukrainian war has changed a lot. Because 
implicitly and explicitly, the European Union has formed a kind of a demand cartel for oil and gas. And this is very important to understand. We have a second emission trading scheme implemented uh, last year uh, before Christmas. And in 2027, the second uh, emission trading scheme will be implemented. And this is an emission trading scheme which fundamentally taxes oil and gas imports. And therefore, the European Union forms gradually a demand cartel for that. US could join this demand cartel. And I don't think there's a need that we pay the producers from oil and gas uh, uh, for that. So we could basically tax away some of the resource rents. And, and, and I think that would be also a way. We, we, we did this because we said also uh, to Russia, we will only pay a maximum price for oil and gas. It worked. US might be also think this is beneficial because this will increase the value of their own domestic resources. And I think it is not completely unrealistic that such a demand cartel could be formed and taxes away. And now your second question, you say it's too simple to say, oh, we have here the, the good democracies and here the bad autocracies because we, we benefit. Yes, that, that's right. And, and I, I can see this. But I think I, I was had a little bit a, a more narrow question, so to say, how, how the democracies could deal on the oil and the gas market. It was a little bit more narrow, uh, fo uh, had, a, had a, a more narrow focus, and, and I agree with you. But, but basically, this conflict on the oil and the gas market is something which is an emerging conflict, and this has to be addressed. And I think this is definitely um, a, a, a conflict between autocracies and democracies, and we have to think smart about this. I'm not saying. Let's let's create a lot of conflicts. That's nice, but what I'm saying is we we, <coughs> we need some kind of tools which allows us uh, to to offer cooperation, but also uh, to 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 have some 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 penalizing tools in in in, in our portfolio. Thank you. I might be a more pessimist of some democracies, but uh, yeah. I just want to follow up about if I understood correctly, this is about uh, taxing away. I mean, surely like Norwegian oil. You put up the taxes, they're not going to take it up anymore. The Saudi Arabian oil, I mean, it's so cheap to bring up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I, I would like to remind you, uh, you're right, but what, I, what I'm saying is when the European Union is serious about the European Green, Green Deal, this would imply that we will reduce our oil and gas imports dramatically. And this has a quantity effect on the resource market. Mm. The same is true if the Inflation Reduction Act Will, will will be implemented and and this is implemented in a serious way this will also reduce oil and gas imports and oil and gas use in the united states which has also a quantitative effect on the on the gas market anyway so we are now rearranging and redesigning this international gas and resource market and and, <coughs> and this is something which which should be analyzed carefully i have no solution for this but i just describe so mm -mm. the so the 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 emergent structure yeah, no, that's an important issue. I see that we have John Broom online, and he has oh. proposed a climate, a climate World Bank or something like this. Uh, I think we have a follow-up question from Malcolm. Is that correct? Malcolm? Hi, uh, I'm uh, Malcolm Fairbrother, sociologist, uh, currently in Graz. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that you just mentioned uh, was described by Paul Krugman uh, in a New York Times piece this week as reshaping the economy to limit climate change. The main reason for doing this via subsidies and industrial policy rather than through Econ 101 recommended policies like carbon taxes is political. And uh, I, found your, I found your presentation totally fascinating. Uh, I studied climate politics, but I found your presentation extremely depressing because I see very little political impetus to doing anything close to enough, anywhere close to fast enough. And I guess you've, you've identified, in a sense, the relative costs and benefits of action for different world regions, key countries. You've identified fossil fuel owners as a barrier, uh, uh, authoritarians as a barrier. Even in the world regions that have a relatively small price to pay for this transition, it doesn't seem to me the politics are very favorable. Uh, I mean, the United States is this fabulously wealthy country, 
and they passed a giant piece of climate legislation that puts absolutely no price on the key problem, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, they're going to spend an enormous amount of money trying, in a sense, to outcompete that. But but this is not much reason for hope. So I guess I wonder, <laughs> in a very general sense, where do you see optimism coming from? I mean, do you just put your faith in the technocracy of the European Commission? Uh, do you hope for, you know, Greta Thunberg to inspire larger numbers of people? Do you think as the world burns, more and more ordinary people will protest and demand something? Uh, I, I'm not sure that any of those are really much reason for optimism. So I, I would like some optimism. Okay. Uh, in in, in uh... Uh, in my past life, I studied theology, and so uh, theology is is uh, responsible for hope. Uh, but okay, now let me let I, I would like to make a few points. My first point is, I strongly disagree with Paul Krugman. I strongly disagree, because I don't think that the Inflation Reduction Act uh, ha it, it shapes the 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 international climate policy, but I deeply believe that. Uh, United States with this strong emphasis on subsidies and industrial policy will succeed because in so this is something which we which we did in in in, in Germany at at a, at a lower scale so we basically we spend a lot of money by the way 200 billion for renewables and we basically the rest of the world benefited to a certain extent from 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 this feed-in tariff system however so we increased the share of renewables. At the same time, uh, we basically built 10 coal-fired plants, and then in, we end up with a high share of renewables and with a high share of coal-fired plants. And, and, and the problem here is with subsidies and with standards that you can bring in the new technology, but you have no tool to phase out the, fas the fossil fuel capital stock. For, for phasing out the fossil fuel capital stock, you need carbon pricing. So I would like to make the following um, prediction. The best times of carbon pricing are ahead of us. In the past, it was very easy for policymakers to hide the costs of climate policy, imposing standards and bans. But this was possible because the ambition level was relatively low. The ambitious level now in the Inflation Reduction Act and in the European Union is so high, it is so ambitious that is, there is no way in the future that we can hide the costs. The costs become visible. And carbon pricing has three essential, which goes far beyond Econ 101, has three essential ingredients. The first one is carbon pricing makes carbon-free technologies competitive. It penalizes the use of fossil fuels according to the carbon content and helps us to phase out the fossil fuel capital stock. And thirdly, it generates the revenues which can be used for compensating in particular low-income households. And by the way, in the European Union, we made a very interesting experience in, in Germany with our famous double whammy during the ca gas crisis, that it is possible to compensate households for sharply increasing fossil fuel prices. In Germany, so nobody is talking about a huge social crisis. So yesterday I came from Germany. I didn't hear something about the revolution. Probably in, when I come back in the night, there might be a revolution, but I don't see a revolution now in, in Germany because of the relatively uh, uh, the gas price inflation. So that said, where comes the hope? The hope comes from my point of view, indeed, from the European Union, because the European Union is their world region where we have been successful decouple economic growth from emissions growth. And the green, uh, the green Deal, the Fit for 55 package, with two emission trading schemes, is, is, is from my point of view a very ambitious target. We will see a, a, a phase out of coal, not just in Germany, in whole Europe in the beginning of the 30s. We will see basically a, a decarbonization in the, powers, a, in the transport sector and also in the building sector. It might be not fast enough, and we might learn a lot from, um, from, from, from the United States, from Inflation Reduction Act, to use our subsidy schemes a little bit more wisely, a little bit more efficient. But I also believe that the time will come also in the United States where the United States have to, to think in a careful way about carbon pricing because they will not succeed with, with, with their program. So this is a, a bad. And, and, and I believe I'm, I am right and Paul Krugman is wrong, so I say this 
um, but but uh, so let's see. But but my hope is indeed in the in the in the European Union. I, I so you you might say it's a little bit too technocratic, but I I think uh, the European Union did by and large with the European Green Deal a great job, and uh, and I also think this is uh, 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 we have a relatively long term planning. EU is now regulating the the carbon dioxide removal technologies. And also, there, there, there basically, there is a lot of incentives for households, for individuals, uh, to, 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 to save energy. So by and large, I would say, uh, I, I, can, I can only provide hope. And you might say it's a little bit this technocratic European Union, but I have a tendency to say I, 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 yeah, I have some hope in that. Happy with that, Malcolm, or you want to have a comeback? Uh, it's a good answer, and I share I share much of your vision, and I also am a big fan of uh, the European Union uh, and and put a lot of faith in it. But I have to say, your answer about confronting people with costs really does not make me any, any more optimistic. So I have led a large four country survey where we took essentially a lot of policies from the Fit for Fifty Five package, asked the general public in uh, Germany, Poland, Spain, and Sweden what they thought, and we randomly assigned people to give different versions of the questions that emphasize different levels of cost. And the moment you hit people with the costs of all kinds of different climate policies, support yeah, immediately goes down. I, I did also service, and it might be at some stage we do an exchange. We made the same. But when you basically confronted the people with compensation packages, reasonable compensation packages, then basically the support for climate policy is increasing again. And it's a, it's from my point of view also a communication issue, I, but but I, I'm not saying I'm hundred percent sure. But anyway, there is no way out because policymakers have to 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 tell people. Uh, so I I would like to 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 share with you an anecdote, and I will not I will not reveal the names, but but I had a conversation with really high ranked policymakers in Germany, and and they claim that they are from the Green Party. And then they, I, they, they ask me and say, listen, in Germany, we have now the goal to become carbon neutral by 2045. Is this not a little bit a too less ambitious uh, a goal? Why, why, not, why not 2040? Why not 2035? And then basically I, I presented the calculations of the underlying carbon prices or the, the marginal abatement costs. It's between 200 and 300 euros per ton CO2. And the first reaction of the policymakers were, please do not publish these numbers because this would be completely devastating. I said, okay, but these are the numbers which are consistent with your own goals. And this is exactly what policymakers like to do. They like to announce very ambitious goals, but they do not like to, to talk about the underlying costs, so to say, and the underlying policy instruments. And this is, this is something which is deeply, let's say, for me as a, as a, as a, as a, somebody who is trained in, in continental European philosophy, I would call this irrational, but you might find a nicer way to, to, to phrase this. But, but, but this is exactly what, what uh, this kind of schizophrenia which we have to overcome in the public discourse. We have people on the one hand say, uh, in, in Berlin, we want to become carbon neutral by 2030, why not? It's, it's not a big deal. But at the same time, they are reluctant to accept uh, prices uh, in in for for building and transport around 200 euros per ton CO2. So this this is um, I think there is a lot of uh, I hope uh, there is a lot of room for enlightenment. Very good. I think then it's fitting to move on to the economist uh, Eric. Uh, I just have to make, uh, You're getting a microphone there. Is it on? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. So. Uh, one question about relating the political economy of authoritarian, personalistic government, etc. Uh, so these uh, sinks or the man-made carbon sinks and captures, is there any geographic restriction on them, or are they like, do they are they best used at the source of pollution, or is there any reason to think that you you mean you mean direct air capture? Yes. Okay. Or yeah. are there uh, like any man-made or man-regulated yeah. carbon sink? Yeah. Yeah, so b when it comes to, uh, there are two, uh, a few components. The one is the ducts. This is direct air capture plus carbon capture and storage. So there, there is a, um, 
a restriction on on the location and this is where the electricity costs are lowest so it's uh, it's probably not the best way to do direct air capture in in sweden or in germany it's much better to do this in uh, in qatar or in in, in mozambique right because it, it doesn't matter because it, you, you can absorb with the filters at, at, at any place when it comes to us the second component of the portfolio uh, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage then you rely on the on the supply of of bioenergy and 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 again so then some regions have a competitive advantage who can provide cheap bioenergy here so and and i would say um so what what if i'm listen carefully what's going on in particular in in saudi arabia they think about the direct air capture plan and they think about producing with this atmospheric co2 synthetic uh, fuels and also to sell the synthetic synthetic fuels on the international market and uh, aramco if i'm not mistaken they announced that they want to provide a direct air capture at the order of magnitude in the next two decades around uh, 150 euros per ton dollars per ton co2 this would be this would be an enormous achievement and would make make then synthetic fuels and negative emissions really really competitive so can just a follow up so it seems then that it would be quite easy for these authoritarian regimes who who rely on oil revenue to yes. to keep that to 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 complement it or or substitute yeah. it with a source that they can control almost equally well uh, th that's that that's a risk and and also so it's it's all about the regulation because they might might create then voluntary carbon markets where they provide this and then uh, therefore the regulation in the EU is so important because we have the largest carbon market and and we are very well advised to come up with a reasonable regulation yeah, yeah. good then we move on to the political philosophy so the sandra you're gonna get a mic your phone here there it is thanks uh thanks for the talk um so i'll i'll just ask uh two things um first one is about, about you know you started out talking about uh why it uh, you know it might be important to have ethics uh, uh, philosophical ethics uh, look at these issues and i think gustav said there was an excellent chapter by ethicists which i haven't read so i, I don't know but um, from what you've said in this talk i don't i mean i'm a little skeptical about this can, so maybe you can elaborate on where the ethics comes in now i and i can see where political theory, political economy, uh, social science, interdisciplinary might help. And this will, so that's the first part. So this will lead me to the second part. And this has to do with uh, the democracies versus autocracies thing. And uh, I mean, part of what I wanted to say is, I mean, Gustav already said, but um, how, so let's take China and India. Okay. so. Would uh, how how would you classify? It? I mean, uh, uh, China would be in the autocracy section, and India would be in the democracy section. Um, if if that is so, I think I mean, that's standardly how it's done in in the West, anyway, right? Um, if that's how you do it, then um, one question is: uh, Who do you think's done more uh, to fight uh, climate change between those two countries? Um, the autocratic China or democratic India? And um, second part is, if if I'm not mistaken, uh, the way the world is going now geopolitically, um, China and India and Russia are becoming closer uh, um, rather than apart. So uh, I'm not sure how that works uh, on this democracy versus autocracies thing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I'm I'm not very well equipped to answer all your questions satisfactorily in a satisfactory way. Now, first, the the, the ethics. I, I I'm less skeptical because as soon as you think about, for example, about the distribution of burden across generations. So I, th this is all about this this issue of, of of discounting and and such kind of things. This is an issue of of of, of ethics. Uh, another thing is, for example, how could you include in such a framework, which is primarily driven by the utilitarian framework, intrinsic values like 
it can be done and, and and this has been discussed in this chapter so to say how to deal with intrinsic values um then the you whole mean apart from uh, human be the welfare of human beings so yeah but yeah. you could say uh, the climate has an for, for mm. well, biodiversity has an intrinsic value right so to say how to deal with with, with that it's it is not a value because we uh, we benefit f in, in 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 the production and the consumption from from pollination and such kind of things um, and 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 the other thing is so to say ab about just transition. So it's uh, and and a very simple thing, uh, what, which I would like to can share. So in the last in the fifth assessment report, we had a big fight, and you might be surprised about this. We had three representations in in the chapter, which has a lot to do with ethics. Three representations about about the past emissions. We had production and consumption based. We had historical emissions, and we had emissions. Uh, according to, to to income levels, just that, the governments completely deleted all these figures from our summary for policymakers. All of them, because they represent a deep a deep understanding about ab about the historic burden, right? And then we we, we published this in in Science immediately after the the, the, the plenary session. So this creates a lot of turmoil within the IPCC. We did this because we thought it is not appropriate for governments to delete uh, uh, figures which we have produced as scientists. But, but all these things uh, uh, are, are, are heavily, are heavily value-laden and, and, and I would say um, uh, requires a specific ethical point of view. And, and therefore, I, I'm not skeptical at all to in involve philosophers because this this fact value distinction is is an important uh, part of that and and if you th I wasn't saying don't involve philosophers I was just wondering what moral philosophy yeah but moral has, so has to contribute I, I perceive welfare economics as as a mathematical form of of uh, of moral philosophy so in that sense we we are dealing with all sorts of of things in the whole IPCC report Wh what I have shown you this transformation pathways these are cost-effective pathways. They also assume some kind of discount rate. So I, 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 I didn't talk about this. And all these things are there. And, and, and therefore, this uh, has to be discussed. And, and in that sense, I would say the contribution of moral philosophers are, uh, are inevitably necessary. So the last thing you asked me, I, I'm not in a position to answer your question. So what, what will be the the next word order so this this is uh, definitely beyond my my expertise and you asked the question who has done more uh, china or 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 india uh, i would say if you if you look at china by and large china has increased emissions uh, dramatically so there is no no bending the, the curve uh, in in india this is a different situation because india is 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 catching up India is now talking about the national emissions trading scheme. China is is is, is doing the same. I, I don't think that, that China is in particular successful in the implementation of uh, climate policy because all the climate policy they have implemented is basically overcompensated by 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 economic growth. And um, you ask the question: So is there a systematic is there a systematic difference between democracies and uh, and, and autocracies in implementing climate policy, I would say the, um, it's hard to answer. The, the only region where we see basically a decoupling of growth and emissions is, is the European Union and to a certain extent the United States. All in, in all the other world regions we see increasing emissions. On that point, join me and thank Altman for this uh, great talk. Some became a little pessimist, but we learn a lot. We have now a number of talks coming up. So we have on May 24th, Sarah Birch, uh, professor of political science at King's College. She's going to talk about voting for the future, electoral institutions and time horizons of democracies. On May 30th, we have our, our own Ole Hegström, who is also a professor of mathemat mathematical statistics at Chalmers. And he's going to talk about uh, large language models, uh, uh, AI risk and AI alignment. And then jumping to a very different topic. Michael Rosen, who is a professor of political science and ethics at uh, Harvard, he's going to talk about his book, The Shadow of God and the Passage from Heaven to History. And lastly, we have June 21st, Clemens Kappel, 
professor at the Department of Communication at Copenhagen. The epistemic significance of convergence in ethical theory is quite a broad issue. Also check the homepage because it might pop up another talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's quite a, a nice talk.